Just about 150 years ago, Britain invented the steam engine. Out of its possibilities grew much of British industry and a new method of transport which was to spread over most of the world. Men took easily to steam. It was a simple step from natural forms of energy to this great new source of power. To the people who lit the fires, kept the mechanism adjusted, wove the lubrication trims, raised steam in them and drove them, the engines seemed full of human trays. They could be coaxed or driven. They went better one day than another. If any part failed, they always seemed loyal enough to limp home somehow. Above all, they needed the simple skills men understood best to make them go. Before long, Britain was sharing her invention with the world. British locos, equipment and experience was at work on every continent. It seemed the great days of steam would last forever. But its very success gave men the impetus and the wherewithal to search for other forms of power. And as time went on, they found them. Now, by comparison, steam was found wanting. Wanting too was the costly staff needed to maintain the engines. For technical progress had gradually turned men's interest to more advanced machinery. The kind of mind which foresaw the wonders of steam in the 1840s, foresaw in the 1940s serious economic and technical problems for Britain unless the steam engine was replaced. A metamorphosis had to come about technically and in the minds of railwomen. Before the locos could change, the men had to change. Steam men all, from chief engineer to past fireman, they had to start learning their life's work all over again. And so by the 1950s, queues had begun to form at the breakers' yards. For the brass, the nickel, the iron, steel and copper could be used as scrap to finance the new venture and as substance to form perhaps components for the new machines. So into the melting pot went the metals and materials of the steam age. Still a little further than the pioneering stage in the early 50s, the decision to install it was as far-sighted as some of the great decisions of a hundred years before. But what goes on inside an electric locomotive? It takes 25,000 volts AC, transforms it, rectifies it, and passes 750 volts onto the motors on the axles. Like a toy with the top off, the engine looks a little unreal on the factory floor. Unreality increases inside the loco, for power is felt, yet is unseen. The pantograph is up. The air blast circuit breaker closes. And the maze of electrical equipment is alive. The controller is switched to forward and notches up. Immediately, the motor contactors close, connecting them to the other main circuits.
The current is now passing through the transformer, through the control equipment to the rectifiers, and from the rectifiers through the floor to the motors. As the controller notches up again, the transformer tap changer allows more power to pass to the rectifiers and on to the motors. Soon, even this movement will disappear, for the new transformers use thyristors, static switching devices which need little maintenance. The demands of travellers and industry on the railway result in such a tangle of tracks and such a catalogue of traffics that flexibility is essential. One type of traction could never be suitable everywhere. Smile, please. Hold it. What better machine for all the non-electric jobs than the diesel? With its three ways of transferring power to the track. Mechanical, hydraulic, and electric transmission. But what is a diesel electric locomotive? It has a diesel engine giving anything from 800 to 4,000 horsepower. This drives a generator which produces current for the electric motors fitted to the bogies and geared to the axles. The control system links up everything. The body is little more than a box girder, which uses aircraft design principles to strike a fine balance between strength and lightness. Much of this was known in the early 50s, but no one could be sure how well locos like these would behave under Britain's arduous conditions. To make a start, the railways went shopping, assessing the know-how and production facilities which were available in railway workshops and in the shops of private industry, where for many years, diesel and electric locos and equipment had been built for export. Token orders were placed for several types of loco so that their performance could be compared. The first locos were successful, and this encouraged the placing of more and more orders. And so it was that British Railways became the biggest technical test bed of all time. This test bed acted like a fine mesh through which filtered the weak and the wanting, only the fittest staying on the rails. Paraded like crack troops, their outward appearance pleases the eye, but as with soldiers, their real virtues lie hidden within. As the parts process from stage to stage, unexpected beauty is revealed to those who care to look for it. fine are the surfaces that it is the oil rather than the metal which titillates the sense of touch.
heat-expanded crown and frozen piston locked together as they exchange their temperatures. Automation may produce the parts, but the true eye and accommodating hands must still guide them together. So another engine is completed, wrought as much from operating experience as from metal. Come on, Bert. Today, railwaymen find themselves part way through the great change. Steam has nearly disappeared, and yet to some, there still seems so much to learn about the new kinds of power. Naturally enough, for in only nine years, enough electric and diesel locos and rail cars have been designed, built and proven to replace 15,000 steam engines. Today's passengers expect a great deal from their services. High speeds from most trains, luxury from many, and frequent services everywhere. Every morning, well over a quarter of a million people arrive within one hour at London stations. At this terminus, a train is turned round every 50 seconds. Just one of the six railway regions shifts more travellers in a year than all the American railroads together. Experience as concentrated as this exists nowhere else. Crewe, a railway crossroad on the edge of the industrial Midlands, is one of Europe's biggest junctions. It is a key point on the new high-speed electric railway, which now can beat the airtime centre to centre between London and cities of the north. The diesel-hauled Flying Scotsman is Britain's most famous express. Yet it is only one of several hundred similar trains which run every day. Back in London, ex-steam man Bill Hopkins signs on to drive the Scotsman 300 miles to Newcastle. Running on the famous East Coast route, one of the oldest in the world, the train has something of an obstacle race of big junctions, sharp curves and stiff gradients lying ahead of it. Averaging 80 miles an hour over the Pioneer Railway, is a much more remarkable achievement than higher speeds on newly built railways laid straight and flat. These diesels are only one of many kinds in use, for in an effort to find the best, almost everything has been tried. Many types of loco make standardization of maintenance difficult. Even so, much of the 30 million pounds saved each year by getting rid of steam is saved in maintenance depots. Heavy overhauls are done in the railway's own workshops. But like private industry, they build too. Some under license, some their own design. In less than two hours, the Scotsman is 160 miles further north. Repeated braking and accelerating again to the 90s and 100s gives the loco a grueling time.
over at Crewe, the regulators have passed more than 50 trains of all kinds through the junctions and freight tunnels during the last three hours. In that three hours, Britain's trains have run something like 110,000 miles. The instruments, the traction motors, the generators and the engines will have taken a beating to be experienced nowhere else in the world. Loco life on these railways is harder than anywhere else, for sand, humidity and altitude are more easily dealt with than high speeds between frequent stops. In the signal box at Newcastle, the Scotsman comes up on the train describer and its path is set across the river and into the station. Here a new crew takes over, but the loco will carry on to Scotland and then pick up another train, for really intensive use is one of the great advantages of the new locos. This relentless running of engines throws up phenomena which are studied continuously by the railway research labs. search for new methods, new materials and new ideas is the driving force behind progressive railway systems like this one. One of the many projects on trial is a two-way communication system between a control point and moving trains, over which impulses can be sent that automatically control train speeds. A wire loop induction system is used. A pair of conductors is laid between the rails one of them is zigzag like this, so that the loco passing over senses a modulation in the loop current. Here is the sensing device, the eye or ear of the loco. The modulations can be altered by varying the pitch of the zigzags. Equipment on board the train can be set to receive particular signals and either directly control the train or display instructions to the driver. Accelerate. Break. It is also possible to store information in the loco and add to it via the track induction system, so that all classes of train and all features of the track can be provided for in advance. But that's in the future. Now, as a hundred years ago, Britain is ready with the knowledge, the production lines and the product. Once again, customers are shipping locos and equipment out to Peru, Portugal, Canada, Poland, Mexico, in fact, to the five continents. Once again, the world can benefit from a railway which is not only the oldest, but in many ways the newest, certainly the most experienced, with its trains running over seven million miles a week, the equivalent of two round trips to the moon every day. Mm -hmm.